First things first, Happy New Year. I have about a million resolutions related to this podcast, but I've already broken about half of them, so, oh well. Last episode, we discussed the economic failures of 1622 to 33. Too little agricultural knowledge, too many orders from England, too little support, too few laborers, and too poor a government meant that nothing of value was produced in the fledgling Providence Island. Resentment festered between the company and the colonists, between the civilians and the military, and between the servants and their fathers. Providence Island was going the way of every other colonial experiment. This week sees an intensification of those problems, in particular as the company shifts its emphasis from agricultural commodities to mainland trade. But the disputes give us a chance to look at some of the fundamental divides within the 17th century Puritan movement and how those divides continued and reemerged as Parliament won the English Civil War. By 1634, English tobacco prices had increased slightly, so the colonists were content to grow tobacco and slow down their experimentation with other crops. They understood tobacco. Tobacco was reliable enough, and though they wouldn't grow rich on it, they were also guaranteed at least a little revenue. It was the same calculation with the same decision being made at the same time by colonists in Virginia and Maryland. They grew what they knew instead of conducting experiments which seemed doomed to failure before they even began. And the company begrudgingly agreed to this, but urged them to at least supplement their tobacco with cotton, whose value was more stable. Hopes on both sides of the Atlantic were waning, though. Settlers were writing to their individual contacts in London, complaining that the land wasn't as fertile as Elfrith had initially reported, and that there was drought and that worms were eating their buildings, allowing their stored tobacco to be covered in dust which ruined it. Tropical fruit trees flourished, but they didn't seem to bear any fruit, and the colonists had resorted to living off potatoes. Later reports would indicate that they were eating these potatoes raw or only half cooked, so the quality of life was deteriorating. And even worse, when they'd gone out to actually try to find some slaves, they had discovered that the Spanish had exterminated the settlement on Association Island. Association Island was owned by the Providence Island Company, and it was populated by some of the Providence Island-bound settlers who had built a small agricultural community to capitalize on the island's flat land and fertile soil. It was the smaller, less important settlement, and to compensate for this, it had brought in slave labor a couple years before. So contacting the governor there seemed like a good place to start in the attempt to get slaves. When they reached the island, though, they found only the governor alive. The Spanish had invaded, captured the island, hanged 150 English settlers on the spot, and imprisoned the others. It was only lucky that they hadn't found Providence on the same trip. In addition to mounting external pressures, or perhaps in response to them, factionalization had increased. Sherard had become the leader of the island's malcontents, much like Morgan had before him. People with complaints from the pettiest to the most fundamental saw him as their standard bearer. 
The ones pushing for fundamental change were Halhead and Rishworth, who wanted a New England-like system, democratically controlled, but where only the sufficiently religious had a voice in government. Even among the most devout of Puritans, this was a controversial idea, as we'll discuss later. And Sherard played his political role with gusto, denying the sacrament to people that he disagreed with randomly and without warning. So people might be sitting in church waiting for communion, and he would simply publicly pass them by if he felt like it. On the other side of the factional divide were the military people and sea captains. They were used to a rough, hedonistic life that shocked the civilians who had been promised the creation of a godly society. And they expected to be the ones in control of the colony because they were skilled, experienced, higher class, and politically connected. Elfrith was, after all, Governor Bell's father-in-law. Their goal on the island was to privateer, privateering being the best way to support Protestantism by weakening the Spanish. But they didn't fit in the kind of religious society envisioned by people like Halhead. So there are two sides to every story, and while Sherrod's actions weren't appropriate, they were performed in a, within a context which justifiably appalled him. The military people gathered around Bell, expecting him to take their side. But to their chagrin, he didn't. Bell was religious, fanatically rule-oriented, and somebody who had experience governing factionalized colonies. He put public order above politics, and instead of exacerbating the conflict, he tried to smooth it over. And to make this possible, he expelled the two most contentious members of the council, Sherard, his pastor, and Elfrith, his father-in-law. Confined to the island after his provocation of the Spanish, Elfrith had become the most combative, most quarrelsome, and most frustrating of the military faction. He even bickered with some of the other captains, particularly Axe. And when Sherard, after being expelled from the council, increased his political agitation, condemning Bell individually as a tyrant and pushing harder and harder for the reforms he wanted, Bell stopped the conflict by throwing him in jail for three months. Then, in response to allegations of unfair distribution of supplies, he demanded that the magazine clerks present their books for inspection immediately, and when they refused, he imprisoned them too. Elfrith and Rishworth had gotten involved in the magazine fight too, and by the end, both groups hated Bell, who was widely criticized as impious and despotic. Meetings of the council actually began to become so time-consuming, frequent, and heated that the company disallowed the council for meeting outside of specific times except in case of emergency. They also made council meetings secret instead of being heard publicly in order to try to contain the divisions. And they also took steps to stop the disputes on Providence Island from ruining colonists' reputations within England. Not only were reports coming in that were so heated and accusatory and inflammatory that they couldn't even figure out who was right and wrong, their own friends and family members were the victims of the worst accusations. John Pym and Benjamin Rudyard's relatives had been accused of particularly horrible behavior. William Rudyard had horribly beaten one of his servants for being lazy when he started to show the symptoms of scurvy. At this point in time, there was still some debate over whether laziness was a symptom of or the cause of scurvy, 
The servant had later died, and the rest of the colonists weren't sure whether he'd killed the boy or the disease had. The event was so brutal, though, that Rudyard was sent back to England to explain his actions, along with other servants who testified about the incident. Though they noted that Rudyard's beating hadn't been particularly uncharacteristic of life on the island. And William Rouse, also Pym's relative by marriage, had struck the island's blacksmith, which was traditionally unacceptable treatment for a skilled laborer. Rouse was humiliatingly kicked off the council, and his punishment was the subject of debate on both sides of the Atlantic. But they ultimately didn't punish him, and did reinstate him to the council. The records which came from the island weren't formal, weren't reliable, weren't complete, and weren't even comprehensible in many cases. But accusations about the behavior and failings of one colonist or another were frequent. So to minimize embarrassment and to minimize the slander of innocent individuals, the company decided that Pym, Rudyard, and two other investors would investigate each letter and remove any reputation-destroying remarks before they were examined publicly. But the company had clearly shifted its focus to the mainland. It hadn't sent them the supplies or men they needed, and it hadn't sent any official communication in over a year. When the investors did send word, they announced that they had gotten a patent to colonize the mainland and were sending dozens of the most experienced people from Providence Island to the nearby Mosquito Coast. There, they'd look for more valuable commodities and try to open trade with the natives. They'd look for lignum vitae, gum, agave, sarsaparilla, dyes, bezoar stones from animal stomach, the stones which were supposedly found in the heads of alligators, and stones from the bodies of manatees. They were to look for potential silk grasses, sugarcane, and detta, which was an American form of vanilla, and to open relations with the natives. And mainland explorers were allowed to prioritize the shipment home of their commodities over Providence Island crops. So to colonists, it seemed very clear what type of a role Providence Island would take in the future. Namely, facilitating whatever happened on the mainland. There was a brief hope that the company would allow the factions to split, sending the military people to the Mosquito Coast and leaving the civilians on Providence Island to build their model society in peace. But the company quickly dashed those hopes. As bad as the factionalization was, they didn't actually want Sherrod's faction to gain exclusive control over the colony and turn it into a New England-like society. Sherrod was already denying people communion at the drop of a hat, allowing a society to form in which he'd have actual power would be crazy. And soon, Lane, Kamek, Axe, Albertus Blauvelt, and 50 more of Providence Island's most skilled and experienced colonists headed out in two groups to the Mosquito Coast, specifically to one place called Darien, and another called Cape Gracias a Dios, which had been named by Columbus after a storm. There, they met the local Indians who were friendly and who had apparently, once upon a time, met Sir Francis Drake. His visit had supposedly left them with a legend that they would ultimately live under the rule of a benevolent, gray-eyed people, and when the English seemed to fit that description, they welcomed them heartily. They showed them all the flora and fauna of the region, including aloe vera to treat sunburn, but none of it was particularly valuable. 
They gathered samples of a new kind of silk grass, which they named Camex flax, as well as sugarcane and detta. Some male Indians also went to live on Providence Island to learn more about Christianity and English culture. Their leader's son went to live in England, where he was educated and formed a lifelong bond of friendship with the English. And in return, a young company servant named Lewis Morris went to live among the Indians to learn their language and set up a station to hunt turtles. Morris's history is an interesting one. He had already been taught some navigation while serving one of the captains, so after returning to Providence Island a couple years later, he spent the remainder of his time there either trading with the Indians or privateering. He then moved to Barbados, set up a massive sugar plantation with his brother, participated in Cromwell's Western design, though there he was criticized for his particularly profane behavior. Then after that, he converted to Quakerism and later moved to New York, where he set up the Tintin Manor Iron Works, which he passed on to his nephew, who founded the political dynasty, which produced the founding father, Governor Morris, and the Declaration of Independence signer, Lewis Morris. And all of that started with him as an indentured servant on Providence Island. So in colonists' eyes, the company allowed worldly men who swore and drank to join the more profitable expedition, and they deprioritized the shipment of goods grown on Providence Island. And they ordered the remaining colonists to plant extra food to sustain the mainland explorers. They worried that they would soon be no more than a storage supply and organization point for the people who actually got rich. And meanwhile, they would face the danger of a Spanish attack without land, without self-government, and without the opportunity to profit themselves. They complained to the company, but what was the company going to do? By now, they were almost 4,000 pounds in debt, with seemingly no chance of getting their money back. It didn't even matter whether the colonists were giving valid reasons for their failure or excuses for it. They, the investors, couldn't afford to pour money into the colony indefinitely. If the Mosquito Coast would fund the colony, They needed to pursue that and to figure out the details later. Rumors began to circulate that the company was planning to sell the island, but they denied that and they were being honest. And rumors circulated that the Spanish were were getting ready to push English settlements out of the West Indies. And this was harder to deny given the fate of Association Island. Back in England, though, The company was every bit as frustrated as the colonists. They had started testing the sample commodities. The Mechoacan potatoes hadn't been as valuable as they'd hoped, and cattle had evidently eaten all of the dete plants. And most disappointingly of all, the Camex flax was too hard to separate to be a good industrial commodity. It produced fantastic cloth, but separating the flax from the stalks was too difficult and too time-consuming with the technology that was available at the time. They'd have to abandon it as a commodity. In addition, company members were being cheated by the merchants transporting their goods. A shipment of wood from Association Island, for instance, had been sent to France, and the French who bought it paid a fraction of the expected price, claiming that it was in bad condition. This created a multi-year dispute, and the company never got its money back. At the same time, they also sent Henry Darley to Holland to investigate whether ships from the colony were going there to sell their cargo, bypassing the company to get more money. And 
At the same time, another ship they owned wrecked off the coast of Brittany, and a year later, the company was still trying to settle the issues surrounding the cargo. When Rudyard returned from Providence Island to give his side of the servant story, he testified that the island wasn't even worth keeping except as a privateering base, and their authorization to privateer had been withdrawn years ago as the peace with Spain had solidified. So the frustrated investors wrote back to the colonists with the news, with an explanation of their own problems, and with more accusations of the colonists' laziness. They said it seemed like the colonists were more interested in bickering with each other than with working the crops, and it seemed like they had absolutely no understanding of the stakes involved in colonization. How had they let the cattle eat the dete? How hadn't they started to at least grow cotton in addition to their tobacco? How had they let their gunpowder get ruined in the rain? Did they not realize that that gunpowder had cost money? It seems strange to us, they said, that powder so chargeable to us and so useful to you should perish for want of boards, than which nothing may more easily be had. Evidently, in their frustration with the company, the Providence Islanders had also traded their entire crop of tobacco for Dutch wine too. And that was just too much, especially as they accumulated debts at the company magazine. They announced that after this ship, they would send no more money and no more servants until the colonists started sending back a staple commodity. If they were having as much difficulty growing stuff as they said, then surely servants would just be more mouths to feed. Obviously, that's not exactly right, but it was a statement born of frustration. One problem that the colonists had been facing was a labor shortage, and that problem was only getting worse as more and more settlers were asking to be allowed to return to England. And servant terms were also starting to expire. They were also having trouble recruiting people to go to Providence Island, something which they blamed on the colonists, but which probably had more to do with the fact that Providence Island was now competing with New England for settlers. In addition, the company also overturned Bell's imprisonment of the magazine clerks and asked Kamek, who had found the flax in the dete, to keep looking and try to grow the most valuable of the dye plants, a natto. Of course, the company announcements compounded settler frustration. By the time that the company had discovered that Camex Flax was worthless, they had already written letters encouraging settlers to keep working with it, so they just sent those letters anyway. The colonists had waited over a year to hear from the company, and when they did hear from them, they got instructions which were obsolete even before they left England. This discouragement was the last straw for many of the colonists who returned to England while the rest turned their efforts exclusively to tobacco. By this point in time, New England was really taking off, with waves of people traveling there every couple of months. Root, who had considered taking his congregation of a hundred to Providence Island, decided to go to New England instead. He had demanded that the company adopt a New England-like governmental structure as a condition of his moving there, and when the company hesitated, he went to North America, where he founded Rowley, Massachusetts instead. He was only the first of many ministers 
the Providence Island Company tried to recruit, who ended up taking their congregations to New England instead. And the story was always the same. Each one demanded Providence Island adopt a New England-like government system before they'd relocate, but each time the company was reluctant enough that they ultimately gave up on the idea. Even Hope Sherard wrote the company, asking for permission to return to England, saying that the faction against him was unbearable, spreading lies about him, publicly disgracing him, and that he'd been in jail for months. He reiterated his accusations of Bell's tyrannical tendencies, and a friend of his also wrote asking for Sherard to be given special servants and a stipend, and the company agreed to the request. To date, he'd been the only experienced minister they'd been able to recruit, and he was asking a lot less to stay than the others were. So throughout this episode, One of the big themes that's emerged has been the conflict between the Providence Island vision and the New England model. And a second theme is the not just faction fighting, but absolute animosity among groups of colonists and investors. The divisions shed fascinating light on the internal divisions among the Puritans, which would become so obvious as Parliament emerged victorious during the English Civil Wars. And in fact, it was at this time that some of the investors, including Lords Say and Brooke, considered going to Massachusetts. They saw both ventures as fitting within a larger Puritan American vision, and their close associate, Henry Vane, had already moved there. As we discussed in the Massachusetts series, they wrote with proposed government changes, and when those changes were rejected, they decided not to move to New England after all. In the eyes of Massachusetts colonists, they chose not to go because they would lose their aristocratic status, but their reasoning was actually far more complex than that. The majority of Providence Island investors, especially Lords Say and Brooke, saw the New England model as a road to theocratic despotism. Lord Say went so far as to say that no wise man should be so foolish as to live where every man is a master and masters must not correct their servants, where wise men propound and fools determine. He said that New England settlers had overturned the basis of order and true liberty, removing protections for any individual rights or security. They emphasized that being approved by a minister shouldn't be a prerequisite to citizenship. The New England model was nothing more than a return to all the worst parts of Catholicism, and it robbed people of freedom of conscience. There should be at least some level of religious and moral tolerance within a society. People shouldn't have to agree with the majority to be allowed basic rights and protections. There should be a separation between church and state, partially because ministers needed to be focusing on people's spiritual needs, and partially because as humans, they were no less corruptible than anyone else. Good government based on laws and checked by parliamentary representatives was the key to liberty, and New England had failed to set that up. Instead, it had created a purely democratic system in which one person per town was responsible for selecting the voters. So when Say and Brooke had offered to go to New England, it was in part an attempt to shape the New England government, but their ideas were rejected. And when the antinomian controversy happened, the Providence Island grandees felt that their fears had been confirmed. 
In contrast to the New England model, Say in Brooks' ideal society was more of a refinement of the English system. And that's what they tried to implement on Providence Island. King and Parliament, Company and Council. Leading locals would preserve community order and large-scale issues and court cases would be handled by the central government. They wanted moderation in punishment and felt that Bell tended to punish people far, far too severely. And they said that leaders should set a good example for the rest of the colony. They valued ceremony and they encouraged it within the colony as a way to help maintain order. They even sent a silver plate and tip staff to the island and wrote up a set of ceremonial rules to use there. Ceremony, moderation, freedom, gentleness, live and let live. These were the ideals which Say and Brooke envisioned for their fledgling societies and for England as a whole. These two contradictory visions persisted through the war and reemerged after it. Lots of company members died during the war, but the surviving members of Say and Brooke's faction ended up distancing themselves at least somewhat from Cromwell's regime, while New Englanders took central places in it. Say went into retirement after the execution of the king, and Oliver St. John expressed his own reservations about it, though he did end up getting pulled back into Cromwell's government. Henry Vane, their close friend who had left New England in mutual disgust with its inhabitants, turned against Cromwell, and Mandeville, who became the Earl of Manchester, was one of Cromwell's strongest parliamentary opponents to the point of helping initiate the Restoration. There were company members who didn't take this stance, but there were also disputes among company members regarding the Providence Island colony. Pym and Brooke, most notably, ended up in an intense feud which only grew more heated as the colony's problems mounted. One of the earliest incidents happened in this time period, with Brooke and Pym fighting over whether to allow Lane to return to the colony after his return to England. Brooke won with the help of Say, Barrington, and company husbandman William Woodcock, but Pym would continue to try to minimize Brooke's influence over the colony. And settler factions were similarly predictive of future loyalties. The captains and military men all took prominent positions within Cromwell's army and government, many of them helping to lead the Western design along with the Earl of Warwick. And the civilians really didn't. Halhead became disillusioned with the parliamentary cause even before the war was won, upset that parliamentarians didn't act against the enclosures, and noting that many members of the House of Commons had gotten rich because of the enclosures. After his death, a book he wrote became one of the key works of the leveler movement. Sherard worked as a small parish preacher in Kent and later in Cornwall, in contrast to New Englanders like Thomas Shepard and Hugh Peters, and despite the fact that he had returned from Providence Island as a hero. Lane died in the Bahamas and his children ended up in Maryland, and sadly Rishworth and his family died of disease in Barbados almost immediately after the fall of Providence Island, so we don't really get to see how he would have dealt with future developments. That might have been particularly interesting because he, as we'll discuss later, became an anti-slavery agitator on Providence. So this is just an interesting glimpse into the divisions and disputes which so characterized the rise of Parliament and which would ultimately help pave the way for the Restoration. Two or even three concepts of liberty 
each accusing the other of being despotic, and each would vie for power in the years to come. But the divisions were first tangible here, in America, and they were refined in the colonies. But we have spent this episode looking forward at future divisions. Next week, we'll be looking back to the legacy of the Elizabethan era.